Thank you all. I think Greg was absolutely right about all of this. He was most right about the fact that the food will make you sleepy. I am, I am not sleepy, but I am mellow. Um, so when Greg wanted to talk, said that it's all going to be about extending the missions. And you'll have to forgive me with the slides a little bit. My slides are a lot like how I talk, which is on the days. FYI. I was like, well, how, how, how does one define that? How does one get there? And, um, you know, what is the best way then to control myeloma and keep it under control? And I thought that the way to conceptualize it for me was really to, uh, to be proactive about it. What I really did was put it into just one expression, if I could, that, you know, offense is the best defense, at least a lot of the time. Not for everyone all of the time, but most of the time for patients with active myeloma. Good therapy and good therapy up front and good therapy continuously, except in certain uh, situations where you have a reasonable sense that you can go without. I think this is something that, that we need to understand. I think in some of the things that we learned from the Arkansas experience was that intensive therapy in certain settings is good. The other things that we learned from the Arkansas experience was that continuous therapy is helpful for most myeloma patients. When daratumumab came along, it was initially approved, as we learned earlier today, in the heavily relapsed setting. And uh, it moved from the heavily relapsed to the early relapse, from the early relapse to the frontline setting. But in the frontline setting, especially with our colleagues in the community, it took some time, in, and also our colleagues in academia, for there to be uptake, for people to say, yeah, I'm going to be using daratumumab up front. Because the feeling was, and I felt this way, which is that, look, I really want to save. It's my big gun. I want to save it for later. Right? The conventional wisdom is that everyone is going to relapse or that a big chunk of people are going to relapse. That's what we were told. So I was like, I want to save my big gun till later. It took a while for people to come around to the fact that, no, getting a good, durable remission, using your biggest guns earlier was perhaps the way to go. And that's sort of the intellectual shift that has brought us to using quads in the frontline setting. And then the data kind of, back that up later on. Um, so I have a, a patient here uh, whose situation I've uh, mentioned who is, um, I initially saw in about 2019 before the pandemic and had a lot of bony disease and had a gain of 1Q, which I discussed with him at the time was a higher risk feature. There are older data uh, suggesting a more intermediate risk outcomes, but uh, in certain settings, this is considered a higher risk feature. But so um, right when we started on treatment and as we went from one treatment to another, um, the COVID pandemic hit. And so he declined a transplant. And we never got to a point where we managed a deep, complete remission. We never managed more than a VGPR. And um, during the pandemic, we actually were on exazomib because people were concerned about coming in to the hospital and getting IV chemo or subcutaneous shots because they wanted to avoid interactions with healthcare where they may be put at risk, which is very understandable. But at the end of it all, we're in a situation where, <clears throat> with a high-risk situation where transplant may have potentially been beneficial, and we couldn't get a very deep response. And so I thought, what could I have done differently in, in this context of how do I get into remission? How do I keep a sustained remission? How do I maintain it? What How do I want to think about this in a programmatic sort of fashion. So I think that if you're going to treat myeloma patients um, who have active myeloma and have an indication to treat, then you don't want to give suboptimal therapy. Up until a few years ago, I was still getting uh, young patients who were being sent to me having been treated in the community with just two drugs, right? Two drugs is good, three drugs better, four drugs even better. And so that was just, you know, it was, it was somewhat demoralizing. It took some time to really help people come around to the fact that, look, uh, this is suboptimal therapy for most people. The only people that I give Revlimid and Dexamethasone to just as a doublet are people who are might be truly fit the definition of someone who might be frail. But everyone else, and even in patients who might otherwise not be considered transplant eligible, for instance, someone who's in their mid-80s, but if they're robust mid-80s, I will try and give them as many drugs as I can get away with so long as I'm not causing them so much toxicity and too much poison. I think uh, auto transplant when eligible is always an excellent idea. Not always an excellent idea, I shouldn't say that. Then my biases come out from having trained with Dr. Bartlett even when I speak that way. But 
But um, I think right now there is nothing that buys as much bang for your buck as a transplant. And there are pros and cons to it. It's an involved process, it's an intensive process. It increases the risk of getting a secondary malignancy, as we heard earlier. But uh, there's nothing that quite buys the same sort of progression-free survival that transplant does. And I have a slide later comparing, you know, CAR T cells and transplant. And, uh, you know, since the very beginning of CAR T cells, I've been hearing, are these going to replace transplant? And it hasn't happened yet. CAR T cells are the only thing out there that have given transplant a run for its money. But so far, that hasn't happened yet. Um, and I think depth of response is important. So in this earlier patient that I mentioned, I didn't manage a complete remission. And in his context, that was certainly very important. All right. But I think we all have uh, physicians that treat myeloma. We all have a number of patients. I have a gentleman who was diagnosed with myeloma in 1999. And he had a plasma cytoma at the time, and he developed true myeloma later on. And he was got Velcade, thalidomide, and dexamethasone when that was very new. And he took a cycle or two of that and was like, you know, the heck with this. I, I'm not dealing with this. I'm done. That was... 20 years ago. And now he potters around, comes into clinic once a year. He always has a little bit of M spike, 0 0.5, 0 0.8, 1, 0 0.8, 0 0.5, and then back up again. And he's doing very well. So how can, can we do that for everyone all of the time? That's evidently not true. We can't leave a lot of people without treatment. And we don't have a good way of identifying who patients are that can necessarily stay entirely off treatment. A lot of it does end up being trial and error. You get into a deep remission, you're not particularly concerned that there are high-risk features. They've gone a long time without progression in the past, so you think you can come off treatment. But these are sort of where the art of it comes into it. A lot of how we treat myeloma is sort of like playing chicken with the proteins and just knowing when to flinch. And um, so uh, I see that when we uh, MRD testing and deep responses are built into assessments for clinical trials, that's great. That I think that's excellent. But then I do wonder, in the real world setting, if I am treating everyone in the beginning to as deep a response as I can get with their myeloma, and I do know that there are plenty of patients, plenty perhaps, who may not necessarily need that, then is that appropriate for everyone all of the time? And these are things that we are actively studying in a, in a you know, looking at MRD testing and, and clinical trials in, a, in an MRD risk-adapted fashion. I We simply don't want to over-treat people who might otherwise end up in a state where they are their myeloma is quiescent for a period of time, but I don't think we're quite there yet. So the conventional wisdom is treat well and continue do continuous treatment. Active surveillance is very important. Planning ahead. I tell patients that look, and again, any of my patients who may be listening will, will be familiar with the concept of the fact that you're in a marathon and not in a sprint. So we need to plan ahead for your next rounds of treatment and so on. So minimal residual disease testing has really just uh, become a very important part of uh, clinical trials and I, to some extent, how we manage patients. Uh, it's a very deep look by more than one method. You can use next generation sequencing or multicolor flow cytometry, which looks at the markers on the surface of, uh, uh, of the myeloma cells. And, and this is great. And I am actually doing it for a lot of patients who might be in a deeper remission to see, uh, or a complete remission to see how much myeloma they may have left over, because as I'll show later, there are some data to show outcomes are different for people that are at different levels of MRD. Uh, of MRD, except that I really still don't have a real idea what to do with that data when I collect. A lot of people don't, and uh, we, we are doing it. And that does give us a sense for perhaps what's going on, but there simply aren't enough mature data for us to make a big decision based on this. If I have someone who has a little bit of MRD left over, a small amount that is static, hasn't changed, does it really make sense for me to try and push that any deeper? Maybe it does. Maybe it does make sense for me to do something if I find that the numbers are changing. The the person doesn't have a fluid relapse, but the amount of MRD is increasing on, on sequential bone marrow pipes or sequential testing. But uh, so th these are some of the things that we struggle with right now. There are numerous trials, many of which I got the master study and many others that are looking at this very question as to say, hey, can we make these decisions based on what the MRD shows us? Can we stop treatment based on what the MRD shows us? Can we stop maintenance based on what the MRD shows us? And will this be helpful to our patients in terms of their outcomes? There are two major methods, as I mentioned, there's next generation flow cytometry and next generation sequencing. Um, you know, the Chronoseq test that you see here at the bottom right, uh, that's uh, um, uh, from this company, Adaptive, that's a very sensitive test 
uh, they have they had a lot of teething issues, I think, in the beginning, making this test accessible to people, but I think it's become a lot more accessible. A lot of institutions do have uh, next, next generation flow cytometry in-house, as do we. Uh, we end up using only one of those because we want to maintain a certain amount of uh, uniformity in how we're assessing our MRD in our patients. And um, so coming back to order transplant versus CAR T cells, right? So uh, the the second question that uh, Jim Kokendorfer was asked uh, when he first presented on CAR T cells from myeloma was, will this be transplant, right? Is this the death of transplant? And so this is Mark Twain, right? Mark Twain took a tri trip to Europe and then back in the States, everyone said that Mark Twain is dead, right? So the, the reports of his demise were greatly exaggerated. The same thing is true of transplant. All the transplant haters are like, transplant is dead, but that hasn't quite happened yet. And, and there's a reason for that. The thing is for CAR T cells to really beat transplant, you have to beat this curve. And the, the curve on the top is looks at a triplet versus a triplet plus transplant. The red line, as opposed to the blue line, which is in most of graphs of this kind, and the, in the graphs that Dr. Butler was showing us earlier today, the red line up top, that's better. Stem cell transplant, it buys you good remissions. These are sustained remissions. These are by and large, uh, the, the toxicities are tolerable, uh, and the access is a lot easier and uh, to get to and a lot more cost-effective right now than CAR T cells. CAR T cells do have stellar overall response rates, uh, and they can get you remissions in patients in the heavily relapsed setting that were, were otherwise unheard of. I mean, uh, in the kind of patients with median of six, seven, eight, or more lines of treatment. And that's why they're being moved earlier and earlier. But at the same time, if I'm using a CAR T cell, which can have toxicities that include cytokine release, neurotoxicity, Parkinson's potentially, in an earlier setting, um, I mean, is that toxicity really worth what benefit I might necessarily get? And so there, there, the, there are numerous studies ongoing that are looking at the, looking to study that. So transparent also buys us. This is the IFM DFCI study, which was the reason that we're still all doing transplant right now, and its follow-up determination trial that came through uh, uh, our colleagues at Dana Farber. And basically, what they're saying here is that the the rate of uh, MRD negativity by flow cytometry is higher in patients that ended up getting transplant. So it is a mechanism of getting a deeper remission that is more sustained. And when you look at these uh, progression-free survival curves, that's uh, progression-free survival is a term that we use very commonly, right? It, but I think it's it's uh, not the most effective term that we can use. In my mind, I think of this as a progression-free duration, a period of time over which your myeloma doesn't progress or get worse. Then, you know what, if you're MRD negative, which is a blue line, then your progression-free survival or progression-free duration is better, and is as is your overall survival. And it the same is true uh, regardless of how deep you look. So the deeper that you look, the better your overall outcome. These lines are looking at different levels on the left, are looking at different levels of MRD, right? So the less MRD you have, the more patients remain in remission for longer periods of time. And the more MRD you have, then the shorter the remission duration. And this is true of the study that, uh, that uh, French did and our friends at Harvard did as well. When you look at MRD negativity, if you manage to get become MRD negative, then uh, your outcomes right at the top with the, the red arrow are in terms of how long you will stay in remission, the probability of you staying in remission are better. But what's interesting though is that once you're MRD negative by a sensitive test, whether you get there by way of transplant or whether you get there by way of, uh, of regular chemotherapy, your outcomes are pretty much the same. So this does inform something, right? I mean, I guess a question that can then be asked is that, hey, if I don't have a particularly aggressive myeloma, I don't have high-risk features, and you go looking for uh, MRD before I do a transplant, and that, uh, because I'm in complete remission, and that shows you that I'm MRD negative, do I really need to do this transplant? And as I was saying earlier, I don't know if we necessarily have an excellent answer to this question now, until some of the trials that we're waiting for do give us mature data. It does make me feel comfortable, though, if someone is not of a mind to do a transplant and they are MRD negative in the setting of a standard risk disease. Um, so what are the mechanisms that we have looked at uh, at Hopkins to try and maintain remissions, right? Aside from maintenance, uh, and that there are many aspects to uh, maintaining the, the remission. There's the maintenance aspect and continuous therapy aspect. What about novel mechanism, right? One of the aspects that we looked at at Hopkins is a vaccine trial, and this is a, um, 
a concept and uh, these are products that I, I think our uh, friends and colleagues at Health3 have also uh, shown a lot of interest in. And the thought process behind this is that if you take, like any other vaccine, if you take bits and pieces of myeloma and you mix it up with uh, a substance that helps the immune system recognize the myeloma and you give that as a vaccine, can you train the immune system to recognize myeloma and help control it better? And uh, Ivan Borello, uh, who was one of our colleagues at Hopkins, was our last chief of myeloma and has now moved to uh, another institution, I did a lot of excellent work looking at uh, what was called GVAX. It's G because of the GMCSF. It's kind of like, uh, it's related to uh, the filgrastoma growth factor that people get with the urine transplant. And uh, what he said was, look, why don't we try and get people uh, to see if we can put people who are, have well-controlled myeloma into a deeper remission, or at least train their immune system to recognize the myeloma better and keep a lid on things. And uh, what uh, we showed in an initial trial which is not a lot of patients, was that uh, for patients uh, that uh, you gave this allogeneic myeloma vaccine to who had, a, again, a not a particularly aggressive myeloma, whose myeloma was well-controlled, uh, whether it was in a complete remission or nearly a complete remission, that if you gave them this vaccine, then you could string out their remission for a bit longer. And that was very interesting. So we did a, we have an ongoing follow-up study uh, that is not currently accruing right now uh, for various reasons post-pandemic, but that combined this vaccine with Revlimid because Revlimid sort of jacks up your immune system. And so there's it's a randomized control study to look at uh, giving the vaccine to people in a randomized fashion and seeing if we can help improve the progression-free survival. And um, uh, what's uh, interesting about this is that, uh, you know, there may be, uh, other applications to this sort of concept as well. Other people have, other groups, uh, including our friends at MD Anderson, have looked at uh, combinations of uh, vaccines uh, with uh, interventions in myeloma and have shown uh, very interesting findings. So I think, uh, uh, you know, we spoke about CAR T cells earlier, but Greg did say that you see have repetition uh, throughout the day. So, you know, CAR T cells, as um, Hans talked about earlier today, are basically T cells that you take out from an individual much like you would do for a transplant, and then you genetically modify them, you ship them to the manufacturer uh, who re who uh, re-engineers them to recognize uh, the um, the target that you want on your cancer cells, and then this product has to be shipped back. So this is where some of the logistical challenges come in. When we first did this at the NCI, it took nine days to turn this around. With the current FDA-approved products, it takes between four and eight weeks, and with Carvicti, um, that, that can take sometimes six to eight weeks. So now when you're taking cells from patients to in order to send them off to be manufactured somewhere else, you have these eight weeks in between where you have to try and see how your patients are going to be treated and how you're going to get their myeloma back under control. And um, although CAR T cells are being used uh, across the board for uh, uh, a bunch of different uh, cancers, the, the way they started for all of those cancers and with myeloma was here in uh, follicular lymphoma with the uh, uh, Jim Kokendorfer back at the NIH who said, look, I'm going to try and use these anti-CD19 CAR T cells uh, for lymphoma, and then that worked. And so the anti-CD19 CAR T cells were used for leukemia at uh, at Penn, and that worked, and things just kind of took off from over there and made their way over to myeloma and to the BCMA. And the thing that was great about BCMA, which was that it's a very restricted target. So this is why BCMA features everywhere. When you guys look out there and you're like, well, I'm looking at these drugs in the relapse setting, and there's bispecific antibodies, those target BCMA. There's CAR T cells, those target BCMA. There's antibody drug conjugates, those target BCMA. What is it about this BCMA? But BCMA is very well located in the way that plasma cells work. It's present on all plasma cells most of the time. And it's very important to plasma cell biology. And um, it isn't really present anywhere else. There, there may be a caveat to that in one instance, but otherwise you don't really find it in too many other places. So it lends itself as an excellent target for... Uh, most kinds of therapies. And um, this was the first trial that was done at the NIH and uh, looking at BCMA for CAR T cells. And it just really showed remarkable responses early on, but people did get very sick. People got a lot of cytokine release. They became quite ill. Uh, we had some robust responses, but we didn't really see um, uh, that. Uh, we saw nothing along the lines of what our friends uh, who produce Carvicti now see about 80, you know, 98% overall response rates. And um, 
what's interesting about this is that, so we had this concept and this product at the NIH that worked, but didn't work all that well. And our friends at uh, what is now BMS took the same product, re-engineered it, tinkered with it a bit, changed uh, the packaging, and you had you ended up getting this trial of Ida captor gene, which is known as a BECMA. And this is the first FDA-approved product, which is simply a, a variation on the on a product that was used in a different setting. So engineering and how you tinker with the CAR T cells really matters. But then came, came along this. I was at this presentation in 2017 at ASCO. These are our friends from uh, Legend Biotech. And these guys um, uh, had this CAR T cell that was take, bought up by Janssen and then later turned into uh, Carvicti. And uh, these guys came in showing us results that, uh, that no one had ever really seen. I, I shared a patient with one of my colleagues in, at the University of Maryland who, had a, who had, had a patient who had gone to China for this study. And all he said was that, look, uh, he was a man of means. He had relapsed myeloma. He went to China and he got the CAR T cells. And all I know about him is that when it, they sent him back, they sent him back with a paper that said this man got CAR T cells and that's pretty much it. But he was in complete remission. So, you know, and so this was really very exciting stuff. Um, and that kind of led to CARTITUDE 1, which is the, uh, uh, the was the, the phase one single arm trial. And this is uh, really what's uh, uh, available out there in a lot of institutions. But, but getting patients on and uh, keeping them through remission and getting on there in a timely fashion is challenging. And there are other products as well. I think those were mentioned by Hans earlier this morning. But I want to bring this up a little bit. So, so now you, you have a situation where patients are, say, uh, more heavily relapsed, right? And you have a choice. You're trying to see what is my appropriate therapy. I've been through some of the major drugs out there. These include daratumab, Velcade, Revlimid, Pomalidomide. And it's time for me to choose between CAR T cells and, uh, and bispecific antibodies. And how do I choose? And if if I choose, and you know what uh, helps you make that decision? How long will patients stay on those? So there are a lot of things to sort of uh, unpackage here. Uh, antibody drug conjugates like belatabab and aphrodisin that that has just come off the market. Cost is one thing, but even bispecific antibodies in most instances are not being given out in the community. Most people have to come to an academic institution to at least get the first few doses. And even if they get the first few doses, you're talking about weekly or every other week uh, infusions or subcutaneous shots. And if you're coming in from far away and these are going to be administered as outpatient, then arrangements need to be made for you to be able to come back and forth. Arrangements need to be made for you to be monitored. You can contrast that with CAR T cells where you have to do the same thing, but only once. Um, one of the things that we're learning from bispecific antibodies is that the infection rates are fairly high. And that may well be a function of the fact that uh, you know you're giving these uh, bispecific antibodies on a on a regular basis versus what happens with CAR T cells, which is a technically a one and done. Um, but the rates of cytokine release are different. But having said that, enough people still get cytokine release with the bispecific antibody. Can I give one after the other? Probably. There are studies looking at how you can sequence these and others that are uh, in the process as well. But uh, uh, that, that are actively accruing right now. But I don't know if I would necessarily give these back to back with each other. And other questions of you know BCMA resistance and BCMA loss come into, come into that as well. So um, I'm gonna try and wrap this up here. So what, what I think the future, what I would like it to look like is that you walk into your doctor's office, you're like, doc, I have a headache and some cancer, right? And your doctor's like, well, here's a little aspirin and some take T cells, take two of each and call me in the morning. So, I mean, I have no doubt we'll get there one day, and I think the data will catch up, but hopefully not too long from now. So I'll just stop here uh, and take any questions.